um, given just today, not at the general conference, I feel like I'm the only global Southian, as much as it goes global Southian for a dual citizen um, today. And I'm also I'm almost the only um, female voice today. Um, so I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to take my right to be a little bit more radical, a little bit more open, um, and at the same time more compassionate. So um, the first little thing I want to say, I'm not very sure about the assessment of Turkey being a democracy still. If you do have the political opposition in prison, um, the leaders of the opposition party, you imprison them for years without any actual court case. That's not typically what we still consider democracy. We would, in democracy theory, I would clearly uh, say it's a failed democracy because there is no freedom of speech, there is no freedom of assembly, and the political opposition is in prison. I myself haven't been to Turkey for six years because I do fear that they're going to put me in political prison um, for free speech issues. So Turkey at the same time is very much also leading a war in eastern part of Turkey and in Syria. That war with Syria is not within the human rights laws. Like you can actually bomb your own citizens. That's kind of okay uh, with our laws, but it's not okay to bomb other countries. Um, so I pretty much divert diametrically on the assessment what Erdogan is. Erdogan is a oligarch who is a power hungry uh, human who does everything for power and not for anything else. So yes, he's helpful with the negotiations with Russia, but that's not for his compassionate nature, but for political opportunism. And then we have to be very like careful, right? Lots of, them, like, lots of times the realists are right, right? It is about power politics more than it's about human rights. So, um, I want to say that first, we like, there's lots of global Southians here. We know it has never been two worlds, okay? There's never been, there's rather been three worlds, four worlds, many worlds. It has never been a binary system. This is, the, this is how the West frames history, that there is this binary system. I'm also not 100% sure if China sees this as a binary system, um, as I, I am observing foreign policy of China a little bit different. There's a very good talk um, by an investment banker, TED talk um, by an investment banker called The Tales of Two Systems. Okay, if you haven't watched it, watch it. He's, an, he's a venture capitalist and he's talking about how he grew up in China and was told this is the best system, this is how everybody um, has to live, socialism is what we have to be inspire, aspire to. And then uh, he went to the US, and that's where he learned the same. Capitalism is the best system, this is what we have to aspire to. But he's saying this was a tale of two systems, because at the end there weren't like two systems, like each system was always claiming superiority. So we have, with 33 years of the fall of the Berlin Wall, we do have right, the end of history. At least we had the idea of the end of history with Fukuyama. Um, but what do we do with the clash of civilization? We engage in othering. Othering is the process of making the other, the opposite, um, totally different. Right? A lot of times we claim positive things to us. Right? The US as the human rights defender, defenders, although a lot of people in the US don't even have clean water. So even their right for their human rights to clean water is infringed on. Uh, the US has a vast prison population, okay? They're in private prison. And there's, there's a whole prison industrial complex, which is clearly a violation of human rights. So we have to see the other side, not as the other side, but see it in a lot more differentiated ways. Right? The world is not black and white. The world is actually has so many colors and there's so many subgroups. Um, I also want to disagree with this tribalism uh, idea because at the same time, when we talk about gender issues, this is not a subgroup, right? This is actually something we should talk about and this is something we should differentiate about and we can do it across nations. So I'm, I'm 
way more happy if some if like people organize around LGBTQI rights for like positive reinforcement for gaining for human rights than for nationalism. Because what is nationalism doing? Like nationalism is typically undermining our human tendency. Um, for compassion, why do we have the drive for compassion? But nationalism is typically used by elites, by political leaders, by political parties to mobilize around resources. Right? It's not, it's not about us being different, it's about using difference in order to gain something, in order to get political support. So I'm very happy um, if the US gets less nationalist. I have lived there. It was unbearable for me as a European how nationalist they were. I um, have a little anecdote. I was, I was actually a high school student. So I was this high school student, and there was somebody else saying, you know, the US is the richest country in the world. And I was like, by what measurements? And also, you live in a trailer park. Why are you proud of this? Like, what does this, this do for you? So I am um, any anything that I'm. A, I'm like a passionate internationalist, right? This is why my my speech is called One World, because this is the only way how I think we are going to get to successful diplomacy when we recognize our common humanity instead of block thinking. Um, so. There, there's, many, there's, there's a new danger of like Ukraine, Russia, to bring us to a new block thinking, right? To bring us to the new point where we have again one block against the other. And that's exactly what we shouldn't repeat. And we do that every time we talk about the war. Because there's many wars. There's at least nine other active wars in the world with more human casualties. And I'm very grateful that um, we at the Academy are talking about Yemen a lot because that's a very brutal and sad war. And there's many others like Mali and so on. So there's many places in the world that have wars. So anytime we should be reminded not to talk about the war as if this was the only thing. Because what is that? That's actually racism. Um, I've felt that since the start of the start of the um, Ukrainian war, that there is white racism, like white supremacy, got like really like a push, like a strong push, right? It's the Ukrainian refugees get a lot more rights than any others. At the Polish border, there were even black students being stopped to enter to flee the country. Okay, so the UK, from Ukraine to Poland, while we were at the same time in Germany being, being shown this, this like compassionate Polish people that do everything for their neighbors, uh, neighbors Ukrainians, black students were desperately trying to flee Ukraine, but they were stopped at the border. So many different, different shapes, and that's nationalism, right? That's like, that's Polish nationalism, racism, right? This is a piss party. They are actually pronounced like that, okay? It's not me. Um, so the PIS party putting forward a Polish nationalist ideology. And that's, a, that's true with a lot of right-wing countries. They're using the conflicts. We are, we are seeing that. Um, when we see... Uh, right, there's like this really nice picture where Erdogan is sitting on a high, high like, chair and then there's a couch and there's... Putin and I think Lukashenko and I don't know who's the third one and Erdogan is making a joke and they're all like laughing like this and we have to be aware that those are not the defenders of diplomacy and so on. Those people, all of them, uh, we have to talk to them and we have to, uh, we have to uh, do negotiations but they are not defenders of any humans, okay? They are defenders of their, their own power. They are playing power politics, and they're not playing power politics for their countries. They're not about the strength of the country, right? When we look at Russia, Russia lost so much power during the war, and also it got so obvious that they're less powerful than everybody thought. Right? I'm sure China got promised by Russia that the war is over quickly. Two weeks before the Russian war started, um, Putin was in China. They said they're going to put forward a new interpretation of human rights um, into the world. And surely, because Ukraine, there's a Silk Road, you all know it goes through Ukraine. So surely Russia said it's going to be fast. We're going to do it. It's going to be fast. I'm sure they asked for permission. Um, to China. Okay, this is, uh, 
I cannot prove this, but this, this is my, my interpretation of what happened. So this racism by Western nations, by the US, by Europe, and so on, is actually an easy play for nationalists all over the world. Because now nationalists can be, and Erdogan will do that too, look at them, they only care about white people, right? They don't care about you. So it's very easy for nationalists and fascists to mobilize their, in their countries, anywhere in the world, uh, against white supremacy. And say they're, not, they're never going to see us as humans anyway. They're always going to see us as second class. And this is what we have to fight against. And this is, actually, this is actually where we have to like dissolve the idea of clash of civilization. And obviously, I'm thankful to my students who says that these ideas are self-reinforcing. If we start believing in those categories, and this is what American foreign policy did a long time, okay, there's this realist in charge that do believe in those categories. Um, they become real, right? They become facts, social facts. Um, so easy play for nationalists. I also want to come back to the idea of that there is one um, block that is for freedom, the capitalist one, right? That's the freedom one. And then the communist one, those were for unfreedom. And when we hear the word freedom all the time, we should ask us, what freedom? Whose freedom? What kind of freedom are we talking about? There's a famous um, article by Isia Berlin, Two Concepts of Liberty. Okay? Liberty and freedom, you can see synonymous there. So negative liberty, he defines of freedom from interference, which would be Müller-Rosentritt's idea of freedom. Okay, you don't have to pay so many taxes, the state doesn't really like interfere, you can do as much as you want. <coughs> There's a very famous spe um, saying by Rousseau, who says that the freedom protects the strong, the law protects the weak. So there's a second idea of liberty, second concept, and that's positive liberty. Positive liberty would be something like schooling, healthcare system, and so on, because when you're sick, what's freedom, right? When we, you can't read, what's your freedom to vote? It doesn't mean anything. So at the same time, those two concepts of liberty are intention, because if you don't pay taxes, we're not going to get health care. We're not going to have schools. So all those like, parts you do need for emancipation do infringe on negative liberty or negative freedom, however you want to see it. So if we, but if we do hear a lot of talk about freedom, we have to ask whose freedom. And when we talk about capitalism, it's a lot of times the freedoms of the rich, right? Or the freedom to buy whatever you want, which is only a freedom if you actually have money. Um, so all this market freedom is not a freedom. And in German history, what we did really wrong is we, we, it, was not, it was not really a reunification. It was an overtaking of one side of the other side. There were a good good, lot of good elements in Eastern Germany. For instance, they were way, way better educated than me. Okay? There was, they had so much better education. So, but there was no drive to be like, let's look what worked here, what worked there, and maybe take the education system and make it the education system for the whole country. No. Instead, now, we all got our education, in, in inflationary education, okay? The whole education system got worse. So we have to be... We have to go forward with a little bit humility when we look at other countries and see it as in multiple colors as it is. Every country will have good aspects and bad aspects. By the way, I do think China is one of the most capitalist countries I've ever visited. Um, so the, the, whole kind, the whole deal of still calling them communist China, um, as a political scientist, is, is not OK for me. As, as a politician, I understand why we call them communist China, um, because that's how they call themselves. Um, so it's kind of respect to call them that, um, but careful. So also capitalism demands neocolonialism. Okay, capitalism demands ex expansion into all worlds. 
So the global south cannot be free in a sense when we like have this, I don't know, somebody did extreme capitalism, what was it? One of you um, made an made a exaggeration of capitalism. In any case, the chances for good governance and human rights do not depend on like how we see those two systems, right? They, they depend on us like overcoming this idea that one system is good and one system is bad. And uh, Professor Köhler a lot, lot of times like points at the hypocrisy of um, of may, mostly the West because we are louder, I guess. Um, but the same hypocrisy uh, we find sometimes in like this new wolf warrior diplomacy of China, um, also. They at least don't have this like cultural um, colonialism and so on. So my whole point about like saying one world is that we have to see each other as humans in order to like talk to each other. We cannot see each other as a representative of a country, and we cannot like do this like blanket blanket assessment of this country is this this country is that. Uh, particularly also because they're historically situated, which was really clear with like Ukraine, right? Ukraine, multi-ethnic country in 2002. Now it's presented as a homogeneous, very nationalist country. Um, so freedom is an empty concept unless we fill it with something, okay? Unless we are willing to talk about human rights and to talk about human rights at the very basic right to food, right to water, and so on, and check, do they fulfill that? And do talk about the right to free speech. Without the right to free speech, can we still call something a democracy? We can at the same time um, have, like I, I lived in China, and I felt I had more free speech than in Turkey. Um, the Chinese government was not harassing me. I was teaching philosophy. Nobody came and controlled what I said. In Turkey, not so much. Um, but how do? But Turkey is a European ally, right? <coughs> Turkey is a NATO member. So now Turkey is presented as this like nice place. Good. The, our foreign minister um, Angela, uh, Annalena Baerbock. No, I'm saying Angela. Annalena Baerbock uh, said, "Oh, our great partner. I'm finally meeting the other foreign minister." This is politics, right? Um, but we have to differentiate that from how we want to achieve. Diplomacy. So, clashes of clashes of civilization, clash of civilization. I don't really think so. At the same time, I think there is a huge drive from the right wing. Like, as I said, I would actually say Italy is a huge problem. I do see fa fascist tendencies. I do see, for some politicians, a continuation. I mean, I'm, they're even related to Mussolini. So I would be very careful in assessing uh, Italy as not, not dangerous. I think uh, also uh, with other countries, we have to like, acknowledge that there is a strong right wing, right? And that this can only be built on grievances, right? When people have grievances. Now in Germany, we have this right wing um, having all these demonstrations because people fear not to have enough food, have too like, high, uh, high electricity uh, bills, and so on. So the right wing is working with fear and working with the clash of civilizations, working with the other wing, working with not seeing the other as a person, as people, but like creating enemies, creating a clash of civilization. So we should pretty much be opposed to that. And in my, obviously, I don't know, most of you know I'm a socialist. Um, so I do think um, that actually it's capitalism. I, I do agree with, um, I don't know, I didn't hear which Turkish professor it was. Um, maybe it's mine. <laughs> I do. Very left wing. One. Le very left wing. Turkey, Atta, if one could not be more Ayhan left Ayhan huh? if one could not be more left wing than him. Yeah, so probably I, I do know the, the, this guy, <laughs> and we probably see each other on the same side. Um, but I do agree. I think uh, it's the fight about resources. It's not difference. It's us fighting for resources that makes us not recognize our common humanity, that makes us not recognize that we live on one world, 
that has one climate in a sense, right? We have different climate zones that um, has one uh, water circulating that we like pollute with um, plastics and so on. So um, recognizing this commonness also means that we have to like think of the, all the resources as shared resources, as something we have to share, and as seeing those people in other places as humans, and not Ukrainians, not Russians, right? And there, there I'm very grateful for you, to you that you pointed out that there has been like, I mean, Russian musicians, right? That have nothing to do with the regimes, are not even allowed to concerts anymore. And this is taking their humanity away. And we have to be very careful. And so my whole, my whole point about this today was to bring, back, bring us back to the sense that the lines is not between different countries. The lines are typically between the powerful and the powerless, between those that have a political voice and those that don't have a political voice. So um, not to see this as like, little countries that are artificial, right? When you look at a globe, those are all artificial lines, but to see it as one globe. And this was a very important point about when we had the first picture of the world, when like this asteroid sent back the first picture of this little blue, beautiful planet that seems, seems so vulnerable, right? It's like such a small thing. And so like that we always are reminded that we are here together, this is our common space, the resources are common, the lines that somebody draw that the oil mine is on one side and not on the others, they're artificial, okay? They're used for exploitation, they're used to make profits. But profits should not be over people. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dita. Uh, I'm sure we've inspired comments and questions. Let's try to take a few, and then we'll move to Professor Bruckner. But who would like to go first? Our only female speaker of the day, as she said, so let's take, take advantage of the opportunity. Comments, questions, we can debate issues. Okay, uh, at the same time, I think you were first, yeah? Yeah, I didn't understand what you mean by that China is the most capitalist country in the world, where like the economy is fully controlled by the state, which is against the capitalist ideas itself. Yeah, that's very easy. Um, there, there's different forms of capitalism, and we tip, typically call that state monopolized capitalism. The, the, um, how all the most companies function are like brutally Manchester capitalist. There is no actual labor rights. There is no proper healthcare system. So the money is used to make more money. So it's all about economic growth and not about um, put, like ending hunger and so on. Um, so I don't know, have you been to China? When you are in China, you see that anything goes as long as you make money. Hi, Professor Daydem. Um, my question is, you, you mentioned about the, um, your point as between uh, the lines are between um, the powerful versus the powerless, the, voice, the, the ones with the voices versus the ones without. So my question is, um, coming from, for example, uh, here we're here in Germany at the moment, and we know that Germany has some, um, some leverage, some powers, and it has a voice. How can we support uh, those who are powerless or those who are uh, voiceless in this in these kinds of dynamics just to um, make sure that uh, nobody is left behind so to say that's a wonderful question I'm asking that to myself every day um, I think we have to those that have a voice have to take the privilege to be honest and to talk about it and uh, not to be scared of the backlash because obviously um, even more like when you look at the US, US politics, the media is dominated by a certain point of view, right? We're like, now we have lots of people being critical of mainstream media, um, maybe sometimes into this conspiracy direction, that's dangerous too. Um, but we have, if we have to, every time, I, I, I'm trying, every time I can, I try to also like use a step and um, Vo voice, be a voice for those that don't have a voice. I think it's very difficult. 
Um, one thing would get it would be like really the fight to get money out of politics, which is a huge problem in Germany too. I don't know if you're aware, but um, the Annalena Baerbock's um, office manager, so like off, head of off the office, sh he just went to RWE, which is the biggest coal mining uh, operations in Germany. Um, so the connections between we have to like openly, transparently, always remind and like talk about the connections between money and politics and try to weaken um, any influences because it can't, like, it can't be, right? We, like, this, is, this is undermining democracy if, it, if money is speech. So um, that would be my little bit answer, but one, time, one day we are going to make a workshop and like, um, talk about how the Global South gets a voice through us. Maybe. Sounds good. Uh, no, thank you very much. Uh, let's take this opportunity to express our sincere gratitude. Professor Didem Adermas.